everyone, and welcome to Dead to Rights, the podcast video for readers, writers, and the crime genre industry. I am delighted with our episode today. We'll be bringing you a chat with Maureen Jennings, author of the very popular a William Murdoch series, which of course, as you all know, has been made into a wonderful TV series. And uh, everyone I know thoroughly enjoys it. So you're gonna love hearing from Maureen Jennings today. Before we get to that, I've got to remind you all that uh, we have an anthology coming up in the fall. And uh, we're, now that we're in season four of Dead to Rights, I can tell you a little bit more about it. It's going to be featuring such wonderful writers as Joan O'Callaghan and Rosemary McCracken and Lisa DeNicolitz. And uh, also M.H. Calway will be uh, appearing in it. Um, and we have a number of newer writers as well. So I'm really looking forward to bringing that out. It's called A Grave Diagnosis, being brought out by Carrick Publishing at, in the fall of 2020. So watch for that. And now, without any further preamble, please welcome to Dead to Rights, Maureen Jennings, author of Heat Wave and the very popular Murdoch series. Hi, Hello. Hi, Maureen. How are you? Oh, it's considered a miracle. <laughs> I know. It's really a miracle, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's really good to see you, I have to say, and welcome to Dead to Rights. Thank you very much for asking me. I'm happy to converse. Are you in your living room? I love looking at you. I am uh, using a faux background on Zoom. Are you? Yeah, isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. um, and it's from my cottage. This is my cottage behind me. I yes. So you're my, I'm working, yeah, I'm working from home, and so my office is my bedroom because Alec is working in the dining room, and the two of us are on the phone too much. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm in the living room, which just has a white background and this but it's my living room has actually become my office which I Iden's very good about that but I love it I've got this little table with all my pens it's oh, lovely and books and you know so it's a small area but it's definitely an office so are you coping with the isolation okay like is it uh, bothering you much or is it interrupting your um routines much you know what Donna it's it doesn't really affect me at all in a certain way in terms of my routine because the routine was now get up, take the dog out, um, have a coffee, come back and email, sit on the computer, read, whatever. Not yeah. any different except the coffee shop has closed, which is oh. so I can only go in and bring it out. But otherwise, I feel a bit guilty. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, everyone else is uh, suffering it, and we're really not that much, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, appearances must be a problem. It, yeah, you know, everything cancelled, yeah. Yes, yeah, because I noticed on your website you've got nothing lined up until, uh, mm -hmm. until this is over, and they can actually choose some dates, I suppose. I guess it's, no one has said, you know, because... When they cancel, the preparation probably is too much to do. So maybe I'm just yeah. thinking next year, honestly, because I was going to, yeah, even November might be too soon for some people. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So tell me about your brand new book, Heat Wave. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's, uh, it's 1936, set in Toronto, 1936 with a female protagonist. And I must say, I enjoy doing that a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a private eye, which it, they did exist for sure. And um, living in the same area of Toronto where everything else is happening. So, and it takes place in the record breaking heat wave in Toronto, which was 1936 July, never before or since have there been such high temperatures. So I thought wow. that was interesting. Yes, so it was yes. 40 degrees down by the lake. Mm -hmm. oh, Are we dinging? No, it's a, so, sorry, it's something else. Um, <laughs> anyway, so yeah, so it's about that. And I decided to 
try to continue the world of Murdoch. So in this book, his son, who chronologically is about 40 now, uh, is in, he's become a detective also. So he's kind of in there. But basically, oh, that's it's, nice. there. Uh, that's it's, nice. it's a Charlotte's story. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And their readers are going to just, they're going to glom onto that Murdoch connection like crazy because um, I know I've been a fan of yours uh, for a very, very long time and in particular the Murdoch series. So I just didn't want to spend this whole interview time dwelling on Murdoch because he's so well known and everybody is a fan. Like, I don't think there's anybody, so I wanted to get down to something new. So what is the name of your protagonist in Heat Wave? I'm sorry, say that again? Uh, what is her name? Oh, Charlotte Frain. Charlotte Frain, uh, she's 30, as she puts it, she's on the other side of 30. So I was trying to capture that attitude of the time, you know, like mm -hmm. over the hill. Yes. Which, of course. And um, she got this job as a private investigator because I was always a huge admirer of Sarah Paretsky and Sue Grafton. Mm -hmm. and, V.I. Warshawski and um, Kinsey. Yes. So, I, so I'm, I know I was influenced by that. And then I went back and did some more reading of the uh, that period, that noir period. With, and it was really fun. I, I must say, I, I hope it's fun to read, but I sure as heck had fun. I can't wait to read it. I haven't read it yet. But uh, when I saw it there, I thought that's a for sure. I'll be buying that and putting that on my list to read right away. Um, it sounds terrific, and I also was a huge fan of V.I. Warshawski and uh, Sue Graft, and I think many of us were. Oh, but yeah. not, I remember, I still remember, honestly, the, it, the first one I read was Sue Grafton, and the excitement, it was like, wow, because n no one had done anything like that before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't find anybody else anyway. And then V.I., and yeah, I know not, I think it was last year, oh, Anyway, I met uh, Sarah Paretsky in person, and I felt like, oh, 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 <laughs> I'm so oh where do you go from here if you've met uh, Sarah Paretsky? <laughs> <laughs> well, you've you've just got an amazing uh, bi bi bibliography. I mean, um, biography, I should say. The the films, the Murdoch films, are there's so many of them, and. Um, <laughs> And the Viaticum. Tell, tell me a little bit about Viaticum. Oh, gosh. Um, I wrote a short story because I've always been, all of us have our obsessions, right? So mm -hmm. mine, perhaps because of growing up in England where I, as I did, I've, I've always, I know I've been quite obsessed with random death as opposed to not planned death exactly, but you know, like knowing you're dying and you can do it all beautifully and blah, 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 yeah. as opposed to you just go out and you, you kill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Viaticum, I was really dealing with that element in a short story that I wrote. The one character knows he's dying and he's trying to reconcile with his daughter. And the other character is randomly killed, just totally randomly. So that was all in the story. And then um, I loved the Catholic ritual of the Atticum, the last rites, the passage to death. I thought it was very beautiful. So that's in the story. And then we met a wonderful woman called Lara Dans, who is and wants to, I think she is now, to be a director and to be a director, she had to have something to her credit. She's like, she's after to show I did this. Yes. She saw the story and it echoed with her because her relationship with her father was very similar, you know, estranged and then he died. And mm -hmm. so she did it. So she said, I'm going to make a short film of the short story. And she, we worked a little bit on the script together, which is, was really nice. Mm. And then it came out and it did, um, it's won awards for, because uh, short films are not as popular, obviously, as full mm -hmm. length. Mm -hmm. Although they're becoming more popular because the young people really like them. 
and the young people like working on them and there's a whole there's a whole my son has worked on a number this is how i know this that uh short films are rising in popularity so you may have really hit on something there yeah well it, it's uh, about 22 minutes which apparently mm -hmm. is a bit long for a short a short film but still works and um i was really thrilled and i thought they did a a beautiful she she Lara particularly did a great job and we were able to get um, Peter Outerbridge who is now our friend who was the first Murdoch. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so he, uh, he's in Viaticum. He's the poor guy who's dying, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, thanks. No, that, at the moment, it's sort of completed its run. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go anywhere else, but because of when I did it, um, it predates a lot of technology. Because as you know, one of the things that's very hard to keep up with is technology yes. and the changes in technology. So, uh, and that becomes dated very quickly. Yes. So it's easier for me anyway, to write in a period where say 36 is historical now really. Mm -hmm. And Viaticum was written I think it, there's one cell phone, yeah, but it's not now. It's supposed to be suggesting that it's 10 years ago, even, you know. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so, we remember when only the really cool people had cell phones and they were huge honkers, weren't they? <laughs> 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 no, it's true. I forgot that. They were so big. They were. And I remember my close friend had one and I was so envious of her and everywhere she went she had a cell phone and you know it was just so cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. they, I guess they've survived as walkie-talkies I guess because they were kind of like that didn't they? they had a yes. yes they were yes they were and you're right I, it's very difficult to write around the technology Yes. It's really difficult. I, I've had a couple of, I've been caught out a couple of times that oh. they wouldn't have had that in that year, you know? Oh, um, yeah. Things we take for granted. Things we take for granted. And anyway, so Viaticum just skims on the edge of that. And as I said, there's just one cell phone, which nowadays wouldn't be true, of course. You know, they'd be mm -hmm. everybody. Right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, it sounds fascinating. Uh, I, I, I heard you say that it's nearing the end of its run, but where can we see it if we want to go see it? I, I know we can't go see it anywhere, but can we see it online? Question, no. I'll, I'll ask Lara, because she's okay. in the States, and it was released in the States. Okay. I know how you access it. I, I don't know. I'll, I'll okay. ask Maybe when it finishes its run, she'll put it up online, and that would be really wonderful, yeah. I think they did a, a really good job. I was very, because you know, as the writer, you're always like, mm, what are you Oh, doing? I was going to ask you, that was on my question list, how you feel, because you've had so many films made, and um, I know you've been pleased with the actors. How have you felt about the scripting? Have you been pleased with it, and have they involved you at all, or have you just decided to turn away? No. I, I'm lucky, and it's not that common that I've been involved with the scripts from day one. Now, that is not that common, but I read the scripts, I can make comments, which they sometimes listen to and mostly don't. Mm -hmm. And then in the last 10 years, I've written a script for the show. So I've okay. been quite involved in that side of things. And I was lucky, because as I said, it's not typical. Mm -hmm. typical. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I can tell you as someone who read your work long before you had the series, and I was delighted when the series came out, they did a great job on characterization. How true they may have stayed to whatever script you wanted, I'm not sure, but they certainly did a great job on characterization. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad to hear that, because uh, uh, that is, I'm glad. And as I say, yeah. a lot of writers can't always say that. I've heard very painful stories from writers yes. who forget it. It was changed. Yes. Literally almost the gender was changed. Or so. Oh, well, you oh. know, forget men. Let's not. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. There were no men back then, were there? <laughs> One would think there must have been. 
<laughs> okay, so the Murdoch, I cannot, I cannot avoid the Murdoch. Uh, where is Murdoch going now? Is he doing anything else or is it really just his offspring? Um, well, in terms of the show, we just heard confirmed that we're going into season 14, which is like, oh my goodness. Oh, we have season two. Oh, oh. <laughs> Oh so, my goodness, season 14. And, and it's delayed because of the pandemic till yes. in August. Mm -hmm. But it's happening. CBC said, yes, it's going to happen. And I am toying with the idea of, I, I was, the book that I just finished, which will be out hopefully in November, is in the same PI series. Mm -hmm. I'm toying with the idea of bringing William Murdoch back. Now he's going to be like 75 or something. So. That's all right. That's all right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Work. But I, I'm just thinking about it. But I think that would be really wonderful. Jack, his son, is going to be there. And in terms of the fictional time, it's only three months. You know, in real time, it can be literally three years. But it's literally July, November, December that the three books will be uh, set, so mm -hmm. uh, that nobody's getting old fast. You no, know? oh, no, that's right. <laughs> well, that's something to really look forward to. So you said that the new PI one is coming out in November. Yes, is that right. Wow. And what's it titled? November rain. I got into weather, so. Mm -hmm. Heat wave, July, November rain, and the next one will hopefully be cold snap, which will be December. Yes, yes. Um, 1936. Very, very interesting time uh, in history, in the world, in Canada, in Toronto. Mm -hmm. That's been really fun. And of course, we would have been watching things in Europe at that time, 1936, very closely. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So that's done. I just it, done it, the edits. We're doing the edit now. Mark's doing the edit, and then I said, "That's it. I'm not going to do another one. It's too much hard work." <laughs> uh -huh. I'm getting interested in some things, and I thought, "Ooh, maybe I will go on a little bit longer." Let's start with the research for you. Is that where it all begins? Because your research is so impeccable. It all begins there, Donna. Honestly, yeah. I. I can show you. I can hold up something, right? You can yes, see. please. Please do, yeah. I keep coming across these books. Well, both of these. Can you see that? Can you read them? Yes, yes. yes. Hold it very still for a sec. Walls Have Mouths by W.F.R. McCartney. McCartney, yes. Very good. It came out in, oh, I shouldn't say my more. It's autobiography. It came out in 1935, and I don't know if you can see that there. Can you see what that says? Well, very still for a sec. Censured by P.C. McKenzie. Right. Okay. <laughs> a book uh, published by the Communist Party, Left Book Club, and it was considered seditious. Well, so. Yeah. So that's why <laughs> Mr. P PC, whoever he was, Mackenzie, yes. has signed his name here to say, yes, it truly was censored and they eliminated all the things that were seditious. What did they do? Did they block them out or did they remove the pages or? Can you see that? See the black spaces? Oh my gosh, how would you feel seeing that in your book? Isn't that horrible? Just eliminate. Now that was the preface, which was written by Compton McKenzie, but the actual book is this young, he was young, he was sentenced to eight years penal servitude because they said he was a communist and he was giving away secrets to the Russians. Oh. Very doubtful if he really was, and it was a very heavy sentence. So okay. he that life in jail. So mm -hmm. that, woo! <laughs> yes, yes. And ha have you read the whole thing? Are you uh, well into it? I'm well into it, and I'll definitely use as much of that as I can. 
This is another one. Dangerous Patriots, Canada's Unknown Prisoners of War. Wow. Boy, now that's not to do with Murdoch. That's a little bit later, but mm -hmm. boy, that's... What year would that have been? Because that looks just like my father in uniform. Does it? What was his mm -hmm. name? Um, it's not my father, believe me. He didn't actually serve overseas. He was, uh, he was home stationed. But um, his name was Burris, but he looks just like that. He had the same cocky kind of rakish with the hat. Yeah. Mm hmm Could and easily have been. Being that this is talk about unknown history. These men were mostly communists, not totally communists. But in 1940, they were considered enemies, potentially enemies of, of the people, Canada, mm -hmm. because of their link with the Soviet Union, who at that time were the enemy. <laughs> they were all put in jail, no charge, no trial, nothing, and for at least two year sentences. So, very interesting book. And they came out, you know, like, why? What was yeah. going on? Very. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. that, that's separate. That deserves a whole movie. Talk about a movie. <laughs> and I find I get absolutely hooked on the research. And it, I have to pull myself back to, to writing when I'm researching because the research is just so consuming. Do you find that? Absolutely. It's just fabulous. And you go, oh, wait, no, wait a minute. I'm not, this is supposed to be in a book. But I find... Uh, perhaps as you do, like you say, okay, I'm going to go to the corner and then all of a sudden there's a detour and that detour, wow, is that ever interesting? And then that starts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it changes the structure. Yes, yes, yes. I absolutely am with you on that. So we've covered off Murdoch a little bit. He may be coming back. That's something tantalizing. Uh, <laughs> we went to the, um, to the, the big ship in Port McNichol. Oh, yeah, Bobby Nickel, yeah. Yes, yes. It was all the craze that summer. All of our friends and relatives had to go out to the, the big ship and, uh, and see it, you know. And <laughs> yes, they were so terrific there. And the ship itself is marvelous, isn't it? It is. It is. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. I believe it's Port McNichol. Am I getting that right? Yes. So if anybody wants to go see it when this pandemic is over, it's well worth seeing. The last I heard, they were, they definitely were bringing it up to scratch to use it as a sort of pleasure boat again. Oh, okay. They did, but I hope, that, I hope so. It has such a strange history because to get it into the Great Lakes system, they had to cut it in half, right? <laughs> and if you're wandering through it, you can see the areas where they, it's been soldered back together, you know? It's uh, quite something. Well, I, I, when I was there, I just, we just went that one day, and uh, a wonderful man said, would you like a tour? And he used to be a purser. I think that's what they called him. He worked on the boat anyway. So mm -hmm. he a fabulous tour. And then last year, I was doing a talk, not there, and this man said, oh, by the way, I'm so-and-so, and we met on the boat. And I, oh. mm -hmm. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, I, I, my claim to fame amongst my friends up north is that I know Mormon Jennings. And uh, so thank you for that. <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite something. And uh, Murdoch, for anyone listening who doesn't know why we're talking about the boat in Fort McNichol, there is a Murdoch episode that is featured on the boat. And uh, I can't recall the title of that episode, but it was a great episode. I think it's called Murdoch Ahoy. That's right. That's right. Murdoch Ahoy. So if you're looking for the Murdoch episode that we're referring to, look yeah. for Murdoch Ahoy and you'll find it. And it's a wonderful boat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, that was, and I guess it's such a small place. Uh, most of the townsfolk are on the background. They all yeah. got, which yes. is now, I, I try to have a tough question for every writer, and my tough question for you, uh, you may want a second to think about it, what's the biggest joy, the biggest pleasure that was unexpected to you in your writing life? Oh, gosh. 
There have been a lot, actually. I know. I've been following. <laughs> there have been a lot. Okay. Maybe something like this early on, maybe only book two. Um, someone said to me that she had been keeping watch by her father's bedside who was dying and she found my book by accident and it had sort of got her through the night and I was terribly touched by that because certainly I, I know that reading for me as a child was an escape mm -hmm. it was a place to go where it was just secure yes and when people say that to me when it feels like the books have become part of their life that's that's a deep deep joy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even if people say someone said to me once i don't know why those nuns didn't allow him to see his sister you know <laughs> but even that even that as a critique i mean it tells you that they're so engaged with the characters doesn't it yeah. um they've invited them into their lives and that's just a beautiful thing yeah yeah no that that that's been really nice you made a little throwaway comment there about reading being an escape as a child, and I know it definitely was for me too. Um, I wonder how many writers do you think had that experience where reading was a lot of the universe, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I certainly, I still love books like the real book, you know, like. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I. I mean, where I grew up, which was pretty working class, it would never occur to anybody to be a writer. I didn't know a writer. You just knew mm -hmm. a book. And there was a name on the book. Yes. And, um, oh, for many, many years, it just never crossed my mind. But you also were saying that you didn't even think of being a writer until what age did, if you don't mind? Well, um, gosh older <laughs> it just wasn't there I, I was reading I was loving books um I don't know actually good question was I 40 I must have been in my 40s when it suddenly almost occurred to me well maybe mm -hmm. I could write a book I suppose mm -hmm. get into my brain because Certainly growing up, as I say, as a woman, you could be uh, a housewife, secretary, nurse. Uh, That's about it. No, there was one other. What a terrible housewife or nurse I would make. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, just doesn't, it just doesn't work. You could ask my husband. I know he loves me dearly, but I don't think he could lie his way through that one. <laughs> the first memories I have of you, Maureen, are walking into the Sisters in Crime meeting with Lynn Hamilton. Do you remember Lynn? With whom, sorry? Lynn Hamilton. Oh, yes, of course. Yes, that was, that was a while ago. That was a, we started at, well, there was Rosemary O'Bear, Lynn, mm -hmm. and me, and we literally published at about the same time. So we sort of saw ourselves as growing up together. That's right. And I didn't know Rosemary O'Bear at that point. I, I later, she's become a very dear friend since, but at that point I didn't know her. But I knew Lynn because Lynn had left the job that I had taken, the day job that I had taken a few years before I took it. So we had that in common, working for the same company and, uh, you know, and in the same position. So I kind of got to know Lynn a little bit that way. And she wrote that Antiquities series, remember? Fabulous series. Yes. Fabulous. I've often thought that if she had been now, that would be a very successful TV show. It would be, yes. So, well, we can't, it's too expensive because they'd have to move locations. But I think yes. it's a fabulous series. Yes, and it was so colorful. The, the, the series was very colorful. Yeah, wonderful. Maureen, it's just been such a pleasure. I mean, I could keep you here talking for the rest of the afternoon, but I, I'd better let you get back to your other endeavors and I'd better get back to mine. But thank you so much. You, you've absolutely made my day. I can't say enough about how grateful I am. Thank you so much. So let's stay in touch. And yes. Continue out there in the world at some point soon, I think. 
Yes, yes, we'll all be allowed to go out. We're, we're getting out for daily walks, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and how is Murdoch, by the way? He's around somewhere. Hang on. <laughs> He's been a good boy. If I didn't have the door shut here, my Darcy would be right up on us. <laughs> I want to thank Maureen Jennings for joining us today on Dead to Rights. Very gracious as always. I am such a fan and I'm so starstruck to have Maureen on. And I just know that you're going to enjoy, going to have enjoyed it. And many of you will probably play the episode more than once. I wouldn't be surprised. I think I will. So if you see all those hits, it's probably me playing the episode again. So thank you so much, Maureen. And um, I also want to thank Ted Carrick who is our producer and also our music provider for Dead to Rights. And I hope we're going to see you next week. So come back and join us. Dusty road, a man alone. His vital signs go on hold. And I don't know what you've been told. But the years have turned my eyes gold. And I told you what you told me. We'd never be in the same boat for free, yet it runs.